Healthy habits. We're in the new year. It's time to talk about habits, to think about our habits, right? You, some of you are thinking about exercise. You're thinking about diet. You're thinking about other things you need to change in your life. You need to add to your life. And I want to bring the focus in on what about spiritual habits? How can we move up and out in new life in Jesus Christ? Last, year, last week, we talked about reading the word of God. And I thought about moving on, but I'm like, you know what? Let's just sit there a bit longer. Let's steep on this because there is some wonderful stuff here in Psalm 19, which just talks about that. But before we get into Psalm 19, I want to talk about something that happened in the 1800s. The New York Sun wrote a series of articles about the moon. And they referenced this pseudo- collection of research that have been done out of the University of Edinburgh, which wasn't really true, but they're saying they've actually found life on the moon. And so in these articles, they, they began to, in, in a satirical way, they talked about how they found this amazing, you know, these, these crystals and waterfalls and bat people. I've got a picture here. Uh, they call it the great bat hoax. So there's these bat people flying around, bipedal beavers, you know, be beavers walking around on two, two legs. It was like a Narnian series almost, and people actually believed it. It was totally supposed to be a joke, but people were like, wow, did you know that there's bat people on the moon, and there's bipedal beavers, and there's even unicorns? I mean, who wouldn't want to go to the moon? But, but people really thought it was true. It became known as the Great Bat Hoax. Six articles. People just sucked it in. And here's the challenge, right? Because you and I are, are surrounded by information around us telling us what we need to be healthy, what we need to do, what attitudes we should have, what, what, what patterns and behavior we should do in our life. And we sometimes don't know what is true and what's not true, right? Like you, I'll read an article one week which will say coffee is bad for you. And then the next week there's an article, the, the benefits of coffee. And you're like, wonder, well, what's true? Of course, coffee is good for you. But, but I mean, we, we, we hear this stuff, right? And we wonder, well, you know, like don't run. You know, you should walk. You should swim. You shouldn't swim. You should, you know, and, and you're like, what is true? And if there was a God, wouldn't it be cool if he just told us how to live? If he just laid it out for us so we could just follow the, the map for life and discover success and prosperity and health his way. And then you encounter Psalm 19 where David says, there is a God like that and he has made himself known. In fact, not just in the world, but specifically in a book, in, in a written, codified instruction and, and, and manual for life. And that in this manual, we can find direction, support, prosperity, value, success. It's all right here. And so we start in Psalm 19, where he talks in verse 1. He says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky displays his handiwork. And of course, the word for God there is the Hebrew term Elohim, which is the generic term for God. Uh, every people group in the ancient Near East had a God, had an Elohim. But in the Bible, we're introduced to Elohim, capital E, right? You know, capital G, God, right? This is the God of gods. He created everything. And, it, and what the psalmist will tell us, David will tell us in verses 1 to 4, is that, that he paints, he signs his autograph all across his creation. The, de the heavens declare the glory of God. Listen to what he says in verse 2. He says, day after day it speaks out. Night after night reveals his greatness. There is no actual speech or word, verse 3, nor is its voice literally heard. Yet, verse 4, its voice echoes throughout the earth. Its words carry to the distant horizon. Okay, stop there. He's talking about just as you look around you. And in the ancients, as they looked up to the sky, they thought, well, there is the power of the universe right there. The stars, the sun, the planetary, you know, constellations. That is how, what, you know, is the source of life in the universe. And the psalmist says, those things up there just point to Elohim, the God who created it all. It's interesting. If you read the, that, those four verses again, 
if you, if you think about your Bible and, and read it, you'll find that it's using all these terms which describe li- like something audible. That the very piece of creation that we see actually is communicating a message. It's, it's speaking, it's screaming out, it's yelling at us. And yet, and, and yet what, what we're looking at it. it, it's a visual thing, but he's like, but you're hearing it. You're seeing it, but it's sending a message to you. I mean, good art does that. Right? Good creative masterpieces tend to, to, to communicate a message, right? If, if you've ever been in a symphony and you've heard the, the, you know, the orchestra together, you know, pulling a beautiful song together, a collection of songs, I mean, there's something about that, right? Or if you've walked through some of the art galleries of the world and seen the masterpieces, I mean, there, there's something about that. But he says in Psalm 19, just the very creation itself, the sky communicates to us that there is an incredible God. I have a picture here. This is, um, this is Wales, a sunset in Wales. And of course, you know what? We, we've had comparable sunsets just right here, just east of us, in my place. I, but I just obviously found this on Google. So there, there you go. You look at that. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, right. Sunset on the west. Or east of us is a sunrise. We'll talk about that in a moment. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, get confused sometimes, right? So there you go. Sun set in the west. And you look at that and you think, okay, that just happened. That billions of years ago, a, 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 just a soup of, of, of gases and different elements that somehow came into being formed together to blast uh, you know, microscopic organisms, which, which, which over time, millions of years devolved into, you know, little fish, which created little legs and, and then grew and then became monkeys. And I mean, I mean is that, I mean, and, but the, the scripture says, no, no, God has signed his autograph in the sky. I mean, you've seen these. And you know, there's just a sense of like, wow, isn't that amazing? And the psalmist says, this points to God. He is speaking to you. And then he says in in the latter part of verse 4, he continues, he says, in the sky he has pitched a tent for the sun. Why? Because the ancient people loved the sun. They thought the sun was the source of life, the the master God of the universe. And, And the Bible says, he uses like this, this temporary term, like it's like, yeah, he's going camping, right? God just set up a little tent in the, in the bush for the sun to, to, to do his thing in the day, right? It's just like the sun is just this little thing that God uses. It's like a little, you know, toy, a little car that, that God has at his disposal to, 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 to manage his universe. And, and yet the ancients worshiped the sun. I mean, the sun, which is 150 million kilometers from our earth, in its core is 15 million degrees Celsius. Its light takes eight minutes to actually get to our planet. Um, Its mass is 500 times uh, anything else in the universe. In fact, 98.866% of the mass of the solar system is contained in the sun. And yet the scripture says, oh, it's just a little thing that God put a little tent out for to, to look after us, right? It's just, it's just a little part of, of what he has put together for our benefit. The ancients worshiped the sun. Uh, several different cultures had, had the sun God, but, but the scripture says, oh no, it's just one of the things that God put in there just to make this all work. It's, it's, it's one of his, it's at his disposal. He says in verse 5, like a bridegroom, it emerges from its chamber. Like a strong man, it enjoys running its course. It emerges from the distant horizon and goes from one end of the sky to the other. Nothing can escape its heat. It's just like all consumed. I mean, there it is. Everyone knows, yeah, we, we, we don't really live without the sun. And you know, we think, oh, those ancients, they were so crazy, they worshiped the sun. We still do this, right? I mean, all of you, if you had a chance right now to just jump in a plane and go somewhere, you would all go somewhere sunny. Let's just be a minute, right? You'd find a beach. You'd find, you know, somewhere nice. You'd find somewhere with some good food. And you wouldn't be like, oh, let's go to the North Pole. I hear it's the shortest day of the year up there. Woohoo! You know, won't that be fun? No, you wouldn't be doing that. You'd be going down. And in the summertime, what do we do? We get out there. We're in the sun. Why? Because we love the sun. But here he says, the sun is the servant of the Lord. 
It's a created aspect of his creation that just serves his purposes. It has a temporary kind of role. It gets up and it goes back. And it's just, it's part of, of God's wonderful universe. And we all feel its presence, but then he's going to use that just to, to say yes. But there's something else that, that is present in our world that speaks to us, that brings life to us. And that is the word of God. And so in verse 7, he changed. Oh, sorry, I've got a picture here of a sunset. Sorry, let's, let's go back. Sorry, there we go. Sun, sunrise in the east. Just so you know that. In the east, there it is. Woohoo. Comes up. And it goes down. Comes up. And it goes down. Comes up. Goes down. Lisa and I, one day, time we were in Florida, and I was like, let's get up early and let's go look at the sunrise. We were on that side of the, of the pan, you know, of, the, of Florida there. And, and I was like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. We'll see the sun come up on the, on the ocean. Of course, you know, like in South Florida, um, you know, there's pollution and weather. And so we got up and it was cloudy and foggy and it was like, you know, like, might as well have been in Vancouver. You know, you couldn't see the sun. It was like kind of depressing. There was little fleas in the sand and, you know, we got bites and it was like, this was not a romantic sunrise, you know, but there's the sunrise and it's like, this is God's servant. It's just, but there it is. And but it's like, but God wants to bring his presence into your life in a personal way. See verse seven. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And he changes, notice the word for God is, is not Elohim anymore. It's this word Yahweh, which is the personal covenant-keeping, self-revealing God of the Old Testament. Not this generic deity that, that kind of dwells in the mysterious, you know, out there of, of the universe. But this is the personal God who, who shows himself, who makes promises, and who, who writes down and, and, and actually communicates through, you know, human authors, his intention and will through his word. He's like, the law of the Lord is perfect. It preserves one's life. The rules sit down, but the Lord are reliable and impart wisdom to the unexperienced. You see, God's word is restorative. It rebuilds your life. It has this, this power. I've got this picture here, right? You know, uh, <laughs> God wants to take the paddles of his word and restart your heart. Because really, without his word and without his revelation, we are spiritually dead. But when the paddles of God's word are applied to your life and boom, and you receive life from God, it, 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 it wakes you up, it restores you, it brings you back to see life in a way you didn't have before. And it has ability to rebuild even the most broken down life. Let's go back to that text and let's see it again. Sorry. Uh, so it's restorative. There was a story of a, a young Roman Catholic uh, priest who was rebuking these couple, young, young people in Belgium because they were reading the Bible. He said, don't read that bad book. And the, wo and the woman replied to the priest and she said, Mr. Priest, a little while ago my brother was an idler, a gambler, a drunkard, and made such a noise in our house that no one would stay in it. Since he began to read the Bible, he works with industry. He goes no longer to the tavern. He no longer touches cards, brings home money to his poor old mother, and our life at home is quiet and delightful. How come it, how comes it, Mr. Priest, that a bad book produces such good fruit? <laughs> I read a story in the Decision Magazine about this communist man in Ecuador who had grown up and his dad was a dedicated communist. His name, in fact, was Lenin. <laughs> they had named him after communist. But he had discovered that, that, that his, all that ideology did not provide for him what he needed. His girlfriend had broken up with him. He had gone to one of the older men in the communist party, and he was like, quit being a whiner, you know. Stop, you know, you know, to, you know lamenting about life. And, and, and there he was. He was ready to take his life. He actually cut his arm, but his jacket was able to stop the bleeding, and he wandered around not sure. He says, what's the use? If my own party does not have the answers to my need, nobody does. I left and wandered the streets. I felt lonely, defeated, and cheated until he heard the singing. And he goes into this place, and there's this meeting at church. This guy's doing this, like, chalk talk stuff with, with you know, with 
you know, art and stuff. And he's, and he's like, well, that's really cool. He's like, can you show me how to do that? He's like, sure I can. You got to come down to the Christian radio station where I work. And I'll show you, well, you know, go to the Christian radio. But he, he was curious, so he went and, and, and the guy showed him. But then he decided that he would read the Bible. He went to church a couple times, but he said, for the most part, I studied the Bible on my own. I decided that whatever I was going to discover, I wanted to discover for myself. In the Bible, I began to find answers to my questions, even while I continued as president of the Young Communist Party. Finally, on, on Palm Sunday, he's like, I'm going to church. And, that, on, on, and, and at the end of that service, I am going to receive Christ as my Savior. And so the guy preached. He's ready to close the service. And this guy stands up, this young communist. His name is Lennon. He's like, hey, pastor, I'd like to receive Christ as my Savior. He's like, oh, whoops, I guess I should have told, I made that offer. And he did that. Seven people received Christ that day. But the difference for him was reading the Bible. And as he read the Bible, God's truth began to flood into his soul. And it restored his life. It can do the same for you, if you let it. He continues in verse 8, and he says, The Lord's precepts are fair and make one joyful. The Lord's commands are pure and give insight for life. And literally, the, the, the text says, you know, they, they, you know, they enlighten the eyes. They make the heart, you know, happy. And, and there's a sense of like, yes, the, the word, God's word brings perspective to life. They help us to see it from a different vantage point, which includes this joy and this insight that we lack I have a, a picture here of, uh, let's, let's go to that picture. There we go. Whoa, there's a, a baby, you know. It's like, you know, your eyes are suddenly open. Wow, I never saw this before. This is amazing. They help us to see life like we hadn't seen it before. The Word of God has this power in your life. And it's funny that, that Don Richardson, in this book called Eternity in Their Hearts, talks about how cultures all around the world have these sort of legends about this book and how they, they lived in darkness, but they longed to know the truth. In fact, this, this group in Burma had this legend about this white brother who would bring this book of life. And, and as missionaries moved into that area, these, this one tribe called the Wa tribe, they were headhunters. They actually, this one guy took this pony. He said, would you take the pony and it will lead you to a, a, a person who, who has the, this book. And so this pony literally led him 200 miles into this mission compound right up to this well. And, and they're, they're like looking around. And then down in the well, this guy's digging the well. He's like, oh, hey, how, well, you know, how's it going? What can I do for you? Right there. And, and these, the people that had been sent, they, they asked him, have you brought the book of God? And he's like, yeah, I have. And they're like, fetch the book. We must be on our way. We brought this pony for you. We got to go and bring this book and this message back to our people. Within a couple of years, they'd have baptized 10,000 converts of this former headhunting group of people. And throughout all the mountains of, of Burma and, and China and across the border there, tribes were, were, were receiving and, and embracing the message of God's truth. But they had this this epic legend of this white man that would come with this book. The book of Siah, the true God. And they encountered it. And their eyes are open. <laughs> Just like this little baby there. Maybe you've had that experience. In the 15th century in, in Italy, the the corruption throughout the whole country and in the religious system was just horrific. There was just, you know, just a, a complete lack of respect or, for God and the leadership was corrupt. And this young priest was studying the Dominican order and he began to read the word of God and the word of God began to just grip his soul. In fact, he came to know Christ as he read God's word. He was assigned to Florence, to St. Mark's, the great chapel there, and he began to preach 
the word of God. He loved actually preaching the book of Revelation. <laughs> and he began to call out the sinful behavior of God of the people in, in the religious culture of the time. And, and people were just flocking to church to hear Savonarola preach. Of course, the religious leaders didn't like it. They dragged him out and eventually hung him for preaching God's word. But he began to lay the seeds for the Reformation, which would occur when, when people just encounter God's word and it brings revival and spiritual renewal. And that's what he's talking about here. Revives the heart, enlightens the eyes. In Psalm 19, in verse 9, he continues. He says, the commands to fear the Lord are right. They endure forever. The judgments given by the Lord are trustworthy and absolutely just. You see, the God's word directs us in the best and the right way to live. It's right there. You wonder, what is the right way to live? How do I do this? Right? Like I said, you're reading articles, you're hearing news stories, do this, don't do that, practice this, don't practice that, eat this, don't eat that. And you're like, well, what do I do? But he's like, I, I find in God's word the right and the, and the, it's, it's the correct way to live. 1999, John Kennedy Jr. got into a plane and his plane got delayed, so he was actually um, flying later than he, than, he, than he should have been flying. And as a result, he, he wasn't sure where he was going. Eventually, they found his plane in the ocean. Investigators determined that the crash was likely caused by disorientation from flying over open water at night without any landmarks or visible horizon. Kennedy's lack of experience may well have led him to trust what he thought he was seeing more than what his instrument panel was telling him. And here the scripture says, you know, the God's word gives us the clear truth about life, the best and the right way to live. David Livingston was one of the pioneers in Africa. He went there to, to chart a course and to create maps and he met and he, he blazed the trail for missionaries to follow and, and initially he had with him 73 books but as he traveled through the, through the, through the, you know, through the jungle and just you know, through, through the harsh climate he began to just discard books discard books, discard books until he had one book left, the Bible <laughs> the one book he didn't throw away and that is the book that sustained him and, and, and opened the way for many missionaries to come into Africa. God's word directs us into the best and the right way to live. In Psalm, in verse 10, he says, they are of greater value than gold, even than a great amount of pure gold. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I jumped ahead. They are of greater value than gold, even a great amount of pure gold. They are greater delight than honey, even the sweetest honey from a honeycomb. See, God's word brings value and flavor to life. I got a picture here of uh, gold bars. Uh, one of those gold bars weighs probably 400 ounces, 27 pounds. Uh, the estimated value of that is 740,000 U.S. dollars, one of those bars. So you can just imagine how much money is located just in this one picture of the piece. And this is in New York. There's also in Fort Knox, there, there's a tons of this bullion stored around for, for people. And, 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 and what the writer says, even this is worth more than that. He's like, I wouldn't trade this for that. You'd be tempted to, I think. But he's like, when I discover the truth of God's word, it has greater value to me than all of that. Then he's got, of course, I got a picture here of the honey, right? This is the sweetest item in the ancient Near East. There's the honey, and it's, it's sweet. And he's like, it brings flavor and value to your life. In verse 11, he goes on. He says, yes, your servant finds moral guidance there. Those who obey them receive a rich reward. There is this wonderful treasure waiting for us in God's word. Now, many of us live our life like this. I got this picture here. We're looking for, for, for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Yeah. If you've ever chased the rainbow, I, I tried it once as a kid, right, on the mud flats. I saw the rainbow. I'm like, I'm going to go see if I can find it. And I, and I kept moving across the mud flat, and the rainbow kept moving away from me, right? And, and that's life. 
Any other answer you're looking for outside of God's truth just keeps kind of out of your reach, out of your reach. And, and he's like, here is the treasure right here. There is a rich reward when I discover the truth of God's word. Now understand, the Bible is not a good luck charm. Let's go back to that, to that verse there. Uh, the, the Bible's not a good luck charm. Um, George Foreman, in his book, talked about this, how, how he thought that the Bible would give him success. He was going to Africa, and, and someone gave him a Bible, and he, so he had, like, all these little good luck charms with him. He was going to fight Muhammad Ali, and he had the Bible there, and he's like, yeah, you know, this is going to help me, and he lost the fight, and what did he do? He threw his Bible away. He's like, well, it didn't help me win the fight. He says, after I lost the fight, I threw the Bible away. I never even opened it. I thought the Bible didn't help me win, so why do I need it? I thought I'd get power simply from owning it. I didn't realize that I needed to read it and believe what it says. Since then, I've come to understand that the Bible is my roadmap, not my good luck charm. Okay. You should have a Bible in your car, but not because you know, it sort of protects you when you're driving. It's so that when you're, when you're, when you're stopped or you're, you're waiting for someone, you can pull it out and read it, right? It's just there, or maybe you could give it away to someone, but it's not a good luck charm. It, it's in reading it that you discover its richness and its reward. Voltaire, the French philosopher, said, you know, in, in 100 years, the Bible will be obsolete. That was his prediction. And 100 years after his death, actually, his Parisian apartment had been converted into a Bible depot, and they were actually making and selling Bibles out of his apartment. People try to get rid of God's word, but it's like, here's the reward. God's word. He says in verse 11, or 12, sorry, who can know all his errors? Please do not punish me for sins I am unaware of. Moreover, keep me from committing flagrant sins. Do not allow such sins to control me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of blatant rebellion. May my words and my thoughts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my sheltering rock and my redeemer. See, at the end of the psalm, he's kind of like, as I consider your word, as I, as I mull over it, I just realize just how I don't measure up to it. And so the response at the end is like, oh Lord, just would you help me? to live this out, to discover this, to walk in this. But realize that I, I blow it and I, and I don't measure up. If you read the Bible, you'll discover many truths about yourself that you don't want to see. Missionary society had sent all these mirrors with this missionary into, you know, to trade with the local natives. And, and the news had gotten out that these mirrors would, would enable you to see yourself like you'd never seen yourself before. And so one of the, the princesses in, in one of these inland tribes said, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like one of those mirrors, right? And so, and she had been told her whole life that she was the most beautiful woman in, in miles around. And she finally got this mirror and she looked at it and then she discovered that actually she wasn't the most beautiful woman. She was kind of homely. She broke the mirror and actually outlawed mirrors in the whole tribe. No mirrors allowed, right? She refused to accept the truth of what she saw. woman came to her pastor once and was like, yeah, pastor, I, I must confess the sin of pride because I, every time I look in the mirror, I'm just, just awed of what a beautiful woman I am. I just, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of that. And the pastor's like, it's okay, dear. It's not pride. It's just a mistake. <laughs> you don't need to confess that, you know. Uh, but we open the word of God and what? You'll discover truths about yourself. Yes, you're a sinner. Yes, your life doesn't measure up. But you'll discover God's grace and his mercy, and in the end of this psalm, he's inviting us to pray like, like this. Just help my words and my thoughts to be acceptable to you, O Lord, because I want your word to have this impact in my life. And that's what I'm inviting you to do with me, to encounter and discover the truth of God's word. Now, here's the issue. You may believe this, but you don't really believe it if you don't do it. Oh, yeah, I love the Bible. It's great. Yeah, da, da, da. Well, I'm a person of the book. But has the truth of God's word penetrated? Is it, is, it, is it changing you? Is it transforming you? I mean, there's people that read the Bible that don't care really about the message. They just want to learn facts and details. But, but God, the God of the universe, the personal creator and covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God is saying to you and to me, come and know me. The Bible is a relational invitation, not information. It's relational invitation. Come and discover me. Discover my will. 
find the way to live life. Would you encounter the Bible with me this year? It's a healthy habit. Team, would you come up and, and we're going we're gonna to close in, in a song, but if if you haven't encountered the Bible, and maybe you are like one of these people I told the story of, you, 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 you're today, you're looking for truth. And the Bible invi- in, in, it leads us to, to the truth about Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, rose again, and that this is, is the, 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 the capstone of life. We find this truth in the Word of God, that yes, God had a plan, that plan culminated in Jesus dying and rising again, and that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That truth is found in the Word of God. And then everything else just builds on top of that. None of this will make sense without Jesus. But the book brings us back to Jesus and invites us all to know God in a personal and a deep and a meaningful way. Would you know God that way today? Would you pray with me? And the team is going to lead us in a closing song. Lord, thank you for your Word. Thank you, Lord, that you signed your autograph in the heavens. As we look at the the beautiful sky, the the stars, the the northern lights, we just see your handiwork, your autograph. And yet as we open this book, we realize that you are a, a real living God who cares to communicate to us today. And Lord, I pray that you would communicate to each of us throughout this week as we read your word, as we encounter you personally. Speak to us and grow us. We pray this in Jesus' name.